Right. So uh, I know there's still people arriving, but um, as always with these um, fantastic webinars, we have an awful lot to get through in a short period of time. So I'm going to kick off. Um, you're all very welcome to um, this uh, webinar today, which is um, uh, a CYP asthma update for primary care um, as part of our fantastic Ask About Asthma campaign for this year. Um, if we could go to the first slide, please. Thanks, Jojo. So um, just some um, general housekeeping. Um, you'll all automatically have your cameras switched off and your microphone switched off. Um, the chat will be open though. So please, um, the, the sort of structure of the, meet, um, of the webinar today is we'll have three presentations, one after the other, and then um, we'll have 15 minutes to pick up um, any uh, questions. We'll put those to the panel um, in the last 15 minutes. So if you do have any questions, please pop them into the chat. Um, if somebody has put in a question that you really want answered, could you like it, put a thumbs up or something on it so that we can prioritise those questions that seem to have the um, the most thumbs up. Um, if somebody puts in a question in the chat that you feel you've got an answer to um, or have some experience of, please um, do you respond. It's a, uh, you know, we've found in other webinars that it's been quite a useful opportunity for uh, making connections and sharing information. So do, um, do feel free to use the chat for those purposes as well. Uh, just to let you know that the um, session being recorded uh, and a link will be available. So if you want to pass it on to colleagues or you want to watch back the fantastic performances that we're going to see today, that will be uh, uh, um, made available um, after the presentation. Um, next slide, please, Jojo. So our um, we've got three really interesting um, talks today. Um, uh, um, so uh, I'm not going to read through them. You can you can see them there from three fantastic practitioners and, and experts in, their, in, in the field of children and young people's asthma. For those of you who are part of the um, part of the network, you'll probably recognise their names as well. Uh, so without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to um, Will Carroll, um, who, um, as you see, there, consultant respiratory paediatrician, reader in child health. Um, Will over to you and I'll keep an eye on the time for you. You've got to be you've got to be done in 15 minutes. All right. Over to you. Will. Uh, yeah, ready, steady, go. I think is the word, Oliver. Um, do uh, feel to feel free to interject if my sound disappears at any point, because I'm joining you from a lay by in the Lake District, which was the nearest place I could find any mobile phone signal. Um, next slide, please. Um, what I want to talk to you today about is asthma reviews and getting it right. And I feel a little bit guilty because although I do do annual asthma reviews, a lot of my time is actually spent not doing annual asthma reviews. And I feel like, like I might be speaking to a very expert audience. But I do like a good mnemonic and I like a good way of remembering what to do. And so I've come up with the idea of please for the annual asthma review that I would like to do every time I got the opportunity. And it's not quite the order in which I do the review, although it, it, it's, it's pretty much the order I do the review. Um, uh, you need to get a plan in place. You need to do lung function and have some measure of what's going on as well as symptoms. You need to ask about symptoms. You need to do an examination. And then you need to think about adherence and the environment. And so that's all summed up by the word please. And those who like to go to sleep for a few minutes in a talk can probably do so now until we get to the end, because that's what my talk is going to include. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. OK, so what do the children tell us that we need to do? Um, well, the children tell us that. Is my sound OK, Oliver? Are you able to interject at this moment? Uh, yeah, you sound fine. Well. OK, it's right. It's just there was a, a big delay on my side from the next slide, please. Um, young people tell us that actually GPs are doing a great job. Um, and the GPs really care and help to look after children and specialists do a great job and they really help to look after people. But the communication between the two sides isn't always ideal. And sometimes the plan that comes from the specialist isn't always communicated very well. And then children and young people and families understandably get very frustrated. 
But the good news is that over the last few years, next slide please, we've actually seen significant improvements in emergency admissions to hospital for asthma. So something out there is working. Messages are getting through and children and young people with asthma are doing better. Certainly the number of attendances at hospital have fallen and this is pre-COVID. This is not something that's happened just because of COVID. We were already heading in the right direction. Although the one area that we weren't really heading in the right direction with was, next slide please, was asthma deaths. And if I'm asked to think in my career about the regrets I've had and the things that I wish I could play back, the biggest regret I've got in my career, and those who've heard me talk before, will be that I looked after a young person who then died from their asthma. Um, next slide, please. And that got me really interested in how I could do better in the future. When we look at how the UK does in terms of asthma mortality, the bottom line is we do really, really badly. We do really badly. Um, I've seen this slide already earlier in this week in the Ask About Asthma campaign from Ingrid Wolf and it's her data, but the UK is lagging behind. And unfortunately, we're not really showing signs of catching up in terms of children dying from asthma. And so really in structuring this talk, I try to think about the things that might help to reduce the risk that children die from asthma. Next slide, please. And so uh, maybe you could think for a second or a minute before I give my reveal, what you think is the biggest risk factor from, for death in childhood. And then, well, just advance. <laughs> I've come up with the mnemonic unseen um, uh, and that describes the children. If we go back to NRAD and we look at the cases that we discussed, there was an element of all of this or at least some of this in each patient. We had unrecognised risk. We had a lack of a plan for the children. People didn't recognise the severity of the disease and Louise is going to go on and speak about that. The environment was unsuitable for all sorts of reasons. The environment was problematic. There were smokers, there were difficult social circumstances, or the child was using excess short acting beta agonists and it wasn't being picked up upon, or there was non adherence. These are the things that were all seen in the children's cases that we reviewed in NRAD. Next slide, please. And the, the bottom line is that there are avoidable outcomes here. There are avoidable factors in 70% of children and 83% of young people who died. So we absolutely need to do better and we can do that within the annual asthma review. Next slide, please. So what do I really want? Well, I'd like a plan for everyone with asthma. I think that's really important. And I've got my um, asthma control test score up there. But we do need to have a plan and an Asthma UK plan will be fine. Any plan, there just has to be a plan of what to do. Uh, next slide, please. And then we need to find out about what's going on in terms of symptoms. There is absolutely no point in asking children and young people with asthma, how is their asthma? Because the answer that you get every single time is the same answer, which is it's fine. And of course, next, it's not fine. And that's not the answer that you is going to, that's not the question that's going to give you any useful information. There are some questions that will give us useful information. And if, if next slide, if we want to be simple, we'll ask for the RCP3 questions, which are, have you had difficulty sleeping because of your asthma symptoms? Have you had your usual asthma symptoms during the day? And has your asthma interfered with your usual activities? That, th those are really simple questions, but it has been validated in adults. And then if you want to ask slightly better and more probing questions, I personally like the GINA questions. And that's, are there any daytime symptoms? Are there any limitations of activity? Are there any nocturnal symptoms or awakenings? Or have you had to use your short-acting beta-agonist, your reliever inhaler? 
more than twice a week and have you had any exacerbations? But of course you can ask the ACT next. And if you want to ask the ACT, that's for people over the age of 12. People under the age of 12, I tend to use the CACT. Of course, the question in the review is who should you ask? And that really depends on the age of the child. Children who are six, seven years of age, they're probably not taking much responsibility for their asthma. And therefore, I direct my questions towards the parents. But as children get older, we should certainly involve them in the consultation and the questions. And they get very different answers to questions about asthma control. Next slide, please. We should also find out about lung function. There is a very poor correlation between symptoms and asthma lung function. At best, the correlation coefficient, so the agreement is only 0.28 to 0.4. That means lots of people have got highly symptomatic asthma, but pretty good lung function, and vice versa. Lots of people have got pretty lousy lung function, but don't seem to notice the symptoms. So I think it's an essential part of the review. Some assessment of lung function, whether that's peak flow diaries, whether that's looking at peak flow, whether it's proper spirometry, as I would call it, or pheno, it's up to you. Next slide, please. I always examine the patient just to check I'm not missing something. I want to make sure that I'm not seeing a child who's got a different diagnosis. And then I want to see if I can confirm the diagnosis. Children with asthma often have got eczema, they've often got a blocked nose, they've often got sore eyes in the summer because of hay fever. So am I confirming the diagnosis? Is the examination telling me what I expect? Next slide, please. And then I want to find out about adherence. There are two real domains of adherence. There's people trying to take their medicine and there are people who take their medicine well. And we have to consider both of these when we're assessing adherence. So we've got our best patients who take it well and take it regularly. And we've got our patients who don't take it, but when they take it, they take it well. And then on the right hand side of the, sc the screen, we've got those people who try and take it, but do it badly. So then don't get any medicine. And then, of course, the people who don't do it often and don't do it well when they do it. And of course, they have very low adherence overall. Next slide, please. And then I try and talk as part of the annual review. I have a little chat about something new. I try and teach them something. This year I've been talking a lot about things that Prasad Nagakumar has talked about. Um, first is how do they dispose of their inhalers? I think most of my patients have been chucking them in the bin, which is clearly really bad <laughs> and my fault because I've not told them before. And the second thing I talk about in consult routinely now is how do they tell when their inhalers are empty. That includes inhalers with counters, but obviously it's worse for those who haven't got counters. And so for those who haven't got counters, I break the bad news that they're going to have to count. And for those that do have counters, I explain that just because it makes a click or a noise doesn't mean it's got medicine and if it's a PMDI. Next slide, please. And we know that those pressurized metered dose inhalers, pesky things, are going to continue to make a noise and have some sort of sound coming out of them for, from the propellant alone for an extra 100 doses, if that's a 200 dose inhaler, or an extra 60 doses, if that's a 120 dose inhaler. Next slide, please. I think the environment is important and it's a useful thing to talk to my patients about. My young people are very committed about climate change and trying to improve things very often. And it's a good way of improving adherence overall. It certainly matters to families as well. And getting them to take a small step, such as taking their inhalers back to pharmacies for safer disposal is really helpful because it starts, they make that one small step and then they think, to, they think about the other steps they can make in their life. So it's very, very powerful. Next slide, please. So we need a plan and it's really important that you've got a plan in place. If you don't have a plan in place, it's you're, you're going to run into problems down the track. I think we all know about that but making sure it's done and it's reviewed and it's the right plan each year is important. Next slide, please. So, if it pleases you, please get it right. Make sure that you've got all these components in your annual review. And of course, you've got 15 minutes to do your annual review and I've 
rattle through this as fast as I can in 15 minutes. So I know there's a lot to get in there, but really all of this has to be there. So please get it right. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks so much for that, Will. A um, couple of really helpful um, mnemonics in there. So, yeah, if you've got any questions for Will, pop them into the chat. We'll pick them up in the um, uh, panel discussion later on. Um, and now I'll move on to our next speaker. So next up, we have uh, Louise Fleming, um, a, a children's spiritual consultant from the Brompton. Um, Louise, over to you. Thanks, Oliver, and thank you all for joining. So, yes, yeah, so I've been asked to talk about which children should be referred to a severe asthma service. So next slide, please. Uh, these are my disclosures, none of which are um, relevant to this presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So when thinking about why referring or who to, I'm oh, sorry, when thinking about who to refer, the first thing is to think about why refer and what is the kind of the added value or, or the benefit from referring. And then to think about who to refer in terms of indicators of poor control and then thinking at every stage of the key questions to ask and what information can be gained at every kind of every um, consultation. And, and Will has covered um, some of this in his um, his talk on the annual review and then to end by so thinking about what a severe asthma service can offer and therefore why children would benefit um, from referral. Uh, so next slide, please. So, yeah, so why refer? So there's a number of different reasons. So for children with poor control, it's an opportunity to optimise optimize management. And really the, the key things are kind of access to a multidisciplinary team. There's a, a big kind of team of us who work within severe asthma services. And we also have access to additional tests and assessments which can help us to understand more about a child's asthma and, as, and about their asthma control and why they are poorly controlled. And then the reason for all of that is to try and minimise risk. So next slide, please. So what do we mean by risk? So that includes risk of asthma attacks. And, and Will has shown us those kind of risk factors, the things that increase the risk of an asthma attack. And we know that the single biggest risk factor for an asthma attack is, is, is an asthma attack in the past year. So it really, they, an asthma attack really should be a red flag to think something's gone wrong with management. We need to do something to improve this child's control because they are the children at risk of another attack. Although there are small numbers, as well as shown, children do die from asthma. And unfortunately, our outcomes in the UK are not good in terms of asthma related death. We also know that there can be progressive loss of lung function and also side effects of medication. And that can be either children kind of prescribe medication inappropriately or those who are on escalating doses of steroids when perhaps there can be other steroid sparing um, medications such as biological therapies that would be of benefit and help to reduce some of that burden. Uh, so next slide, so indicators of poor control. So whenever I'm thinking about a child with poor control, it's those children who've had an asthma attack, as I've said. So a single asthma attack is that indicator. If they've had a hospital admission or an emergency department attendance, more than six abusmal inhalers per year. And in fact, that some recent kind of data suggests that actually two or more subusmal prescription of two or more subusmal inhalers a year is a risk factor for both asthma attacks and asthma related deaths. And that can be because the, the high use of sabutamol is indicative of poor control. It can be because of discordance between um, inhaled steroid use. They're not using very much inhaled steroid and instead relying on sabutamol or because we know that actually overuse of, of short acting beta agonists can actually make um, asthma itself worse in terms of increasing the risk of bronchoconstriction and actually having the opposite effect to the one that we're trying to achieve. So that really should be a kind of a red flag to think what's going on, why is this child requesting or why, why are there lots of requests for salbutamol? And then an asthma control test or a childhood asthma control test score of less than 20 or whichever um, other, other um, kind of validated scoring system that you use. So when we've got a child with those indicators before us, I kind of, oh, that's it. No, that's fine. Next slide. Um, I think of kind of three key questions. So actually, is their control poor because they don't have asthma at all and I'm treating the wrong condition? If they're presenting, if they're saying they're getting lots of symptoms, are they all due to asthma? Could there be other factors? Could this be dysfunctional breathing? Could there be um, other kind of asthma mimics? Or, and if it, if it really genuinely is asthma, why is their control so poor despite being prescribed asthma treatments that we know should be effective? Uh, next slide. So is it asthma? So again, kind of thinking at kind of each 
stage of the pathway, what should we be doing to try and establish um, these kind of answers? And this is kind of based on kind of nice recommendations and also some of the work done as part of the national um, bundle for asthma care. So I think it really is important that we have objective evidence um, of asthma, be that um, spirometry to demonstrate reversible airflow obstruction or variable airflow obstruction. And also peak flow variability can be useful um, for a short period of time to look for that, um, yeah, look for that kind of variable airflow obstruction. And there should now be access to diagnostic hubs. I know it's very variable and particularly for children may not be the case, but to try and um, have some of those kind of objective tests. Within secondary care, at the very least, spirometry and exhaled nitric oxide um, should be available. And as I say, in specialist care, we have access to many, many more tests, including tests of airway hyper-responsiveness, um, induced sputum, so we can look at inflammatory phenotype, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, CT of the chest, bronchoscopy, all sorts of things. So that for those children who, are, who present a very difficult diagnostic conundrum, um, we can really kind of investigate and say, is this asthma? Are there other conditions that um, we should be treating? Um, next slide, please. The next thing is, are all the symptoms due to asthma? And thinking about comorbidities and asthma mimics. Um, and so hay fever, rhinitis, I think nasal um, treatment of the nose is really, really important. And that's something I'm kind of very um, aggressive about. Thinking about obesity and the impact that that can have actually is breathless. Are they really, have they really got asthma or are they just deconditioned or, or getting very breathless because of their obesity? Quite what we do about it is another um, matter, very difficult to tackle. And then thinking about dysfunctional breathing and eliciting that kind of typical history. And then, as I say, going on to secondary care, we may have access to more testing, such as skin prick tests, allergy testing. And again, within a specialist asthma service, we have access to a whole raft of tests that may help to address those questions. Um, including kind of access to members of the specialist team, such as specialist physiotherapists who can really, really help with dysfunctional breathing. And we see in nearly all our children with um, severe asthma, there's a component of dysfunctional breathing. And by managing both the kind of the asthma side of things and also the dysfunctional breathing with breathing retraining, then that can help to achieve better control. So then thinking about why is control so poor? And I know Will has mentioned this and I make no um, apology for mentioning adherence again, because that is the single biggest reason we see for a control, control being poor. And within primary care, inhaler technique can be checked and also prescriptions to see how much um, is being collected. And again, looking at that discordance between inhaled steroids and short acting beta agonists. I'll go on to tell you how we kind of address each of these pillars in um, in, in in within a specialist asthma service. So thinking about um, oh sorry if we just go back again. Sorry, yeah, thinking about allergens, smoking, and then psychosocial issues. But as I say, even though this is kind of what the, the, you know we could be doing a severe asthma service, I do think at each step of the way these issues can be addressed, and there are ways of doing that. And I completely appreciate the amount of time. Um, particularly within primary and secondary care is is much more um, challenging the time to do this and we we are lucky in that we have more, more more time to do this but it's worth kind of thinking about these things all the time rather than just escalating treatment so next slide please yeah so what does a severe asthma service um, offer so why refer um, children on who have poor control uh, so next slide so this is our kind of assessment pathway. So the first thing is yeah, answering, that, answering that question, do they have asthma, the diagnostic confirmation. For children um, kind of seen, generally the ones who are referred to us are at GINA step four or five, so it's kind of medium to high dose inhaled steroids. Often there's a question about should they um, be started on biological therapy, evidence of poor control, and I've showed you the, the kind of the parameters for that. And then kind of once we have those children, we have an MDT assessment and then optimise their management. And then depending on whether we're able to improve their management, then that's great. Then we can step them down and maintain them on the lowest um, possible dose to um, continue with that level of control. If we've done all of that and they still have control and um, still have um, poor control, then these are our children with severe asthma and we would assess them for eligibility for a biologic 
And then we have another group that we know they that we know they don't take their treatment. We know they've got you know, so an awful psychosocial background. We know they've got pets, but they are intractable things that with the, our best efforts, we can't do anything about. And those children are at risk of asthma attacks and as, um, asthma related deaths. And they're our refractory, difficult asthma population. And we would also consider them um, for a biologic to try and reduce the, the steroid burden and those risks as I showed you earlier. Next slide, please. So we kind of talk about our puzzle of difficult asthma and the children who come to us do often present quite a puzzle and we try and solve them by looking at these various components and tackling all aspects to try and um, yeah, have an individualised plan for that, ch that child. So first one is adherence. So as I mentioned before, we can do adherence checks by looking at prescription records and um, by looking at kind of what's being collected that doesn't tell us though what is actually being taken and um, we but you know clearly if a child's only being prescribed 50 percent of the number of inhalers that they would be needed for their dose then their adherence can't be more than 50 percent so it can give that kind of good guide we do electronic monitoring for all the children referred to our um our service and so these are um, we use these electronic monitors, they clip onto the child's usual inhaler and they tell us the time and the um, the date. So you can't just dose dump. We can see exactly when the doses um, were taken. Um, we can also, they, they don't actually tell us if it was inhaled. So you could do that twice, you know, just actuate twice a day and that would register. But we do look at the dates, the timestamps actually. If there's only a second between each dose, then we know that they've not actually been inhaling. But there are kind of newer um, smart inhalers or newer electronic monitoring devices that do tell us more about inhalation. And then after a period of adherence monitoring, we end up with four groups and children roughly divide equally into these groups. So those who during a period of monitoring have good adherence and their control improves and they we need to find ways to maintain that adherence and maintain that control. Those with good adherence, but who have persistent poor control despite that adherence and they are the ones who are eligible for a step up in treatment and potentially a biologic. And then about 50% have poor adherence despite being um, monitored. And of those, about half actually have an improvement in their control. So even though their adherence is poor, it's better than it was previously. And again, it's about finding that level that will maintain their good control. And then this really difficult group, they have poor adherence um, and persistent poor control. And as I say, we, we do a lot of work with them to try and address that, but often aren't successful and we'll consider them for, for further um, step up to a biologic if they're eligible. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, uh, Louise, sorry, sorry, sorry to jump in, just a, a, a four minute warning. Oh, OK. Um, so um, allergens, so we think about allergen exposure. Um, and again, these are children with severe asthma having lots of attacks. Um, so if we show, if we move on twice actually to show both the whole slide and the next one, that's it. So we know that children who are sensitised and who are exposed to an allergen that they're sensitised to are at risk of asthma attacks and and that minimising that allergen exposure. And this was a study looking at um, mattress covers for those children who are house dust mite sensitised. And we do advise that children who are, who are sensitised to a pet rehome their pet, but I accept that's not always um, easy to do. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so smoking, and if we just, that's it. So yeah, we look, we carry out urinary cotinine, carbon monoxide monitoring to look for active and passive smoking. But we need to bear in mind, it's not just smoking. We're increasingly seeing children who are vaping. Use of water pipes is also increasing um, globally. So it's important to include all of that in an assessment of um, exposure. Uh, next slide, please. And then psychosocial issues are probably the most complex um, and the most difficult to deal with. And thinking about those interactions between stress and anxiety that we know drives asthma symptoms, but also can manifest as panic attacks or hyperventilation um, and other health behaviours that can play into those as well. So this really is a very complex um, issue and takes a lot of time um, to um, to unpick. And having a psychologist as part of the team is is probably the most essential member of the team. Uh, next slide, please. And then safeguarding. We end up doing a lot of safeguarding work. So either children who who have got poorly controlled symptoms and yet um, aren't getting their treatment or the environment's very inappropriate. And then we also see um, those with, um, with exaggerated or fabricated symptoms. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our, I won't go through all of this, but essentially when if you refer to a severe asthma 
clinic. This is everything that we do at the first clinic appointment with input from the rest of the team. And then we do a period of electronic monitoring and then repeat a lot of that and then make a tailored plan for the individual child. Uh, next slide. Um, so these are our kind of referral guidelines that are available on um, the Healthy London Partnership um, website and actually are in the national bundle as well. So thinking about which children should be um, which children should be referred and thinking about actually what can we do at this level? How can we address those questions as to whether it's asthma? Are all the symptoms due to asthma and why is control poor? And then for those children who've had all children who've had a PICU admission or if there are any safeguarding or kind of very complex psychosocial issues should be considered. So I'm not going to go through this, but this kind of summarises what I've kind of talked about in terms for what which patient groups should be seen at various kind of steps along the pathway, what should be done at every step, including inhaler technique, smoking history, and then thinking about, you know, triggers for referring in terms of those indicators of poor control. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and it's really about all components of the, of the asthma pathway working well together and working in partnership with the child at the centre. Uh, next slide, please. So, yes, yeah, so consider referral in any child with indicators of poor control. Think about those three key questions. You know, it's important to carry out that systematic assessment and address potentially modifiable factors rather than just escalating treatment. And specialist asthma services should provide access to a multidisciplinary team, further assessments and access to biological treatments. And that's it. So just my acknowledgement slide. Thank you. And thank you all for your attention. Amazing. Thanks so much, Louise. Um, just very impressed. Um, you smashing through so much in 15 <laughs> minutes. Thank you. Uh, OK, so we'll move on to our uh, final presentation. Um, this is uh, Ian Sinner, who's a, um, again, uh, children's respiratory paediatrician, um, uh, is a respiratory paediatrician from the Older Hayes. Over to you, um, Ian. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Oliver, and, and thanks for the, for the kind invitation to, to join Ask About Asthma again uh, this year. It's going from strength to strength, isn't it? It's fantastic to see it spread. Um, really enjoyed Will and Louise's talks and uh, just to give you a heads up I've been screenshotting all the way through so if you see your slides coming up in my talks in the future that's where I've got them from. Um, next slide please. My talk is about uh, distinguishing between asthma and, and viral wheeze um, and uh, over the next 15 minutes I was going to talk about some cautionary tales, the usual cautionary tales that I'm sure have come up this week anyway about making a diagnosis of, of asthma in children, and then to think about what preschool wheeze really means, uh, and to finish off with a framework that we use in our region when we wrote our preschool uh, wheeze uh, guidelines, and I hope that's helpful. Um, I didn't put any disclosures on there, uh, so I have no financial disclosures, but I should mention uh, three things, and I just thought of this as Louise was talking. One is that I am on the uh, the BTS NICE uh, Asthma Guideline Committee. Um, we have a meeting after this webinar, in fact, where we're uh, writing guidelines for the diagnosis of asthma. Uh, the second disclosure is that I'm the clinical lead for the National Asthma and COPD Audit Programme paediatric work stream, where there's a big focus on diagnosis. And the third is that I'm currently leading uh, and have for the last couple of years led an NHS England working group on diagnosis of asthma. So all, all these things do feed a little bit into that, and I should disclose that. Uh, next slide, please. So the first cautionary tale, as you all know, that everything that coughs and wheezes isn't asthma. Um, at a sort of tertiary level, we've looked at uh, some of the cases that were referred as having asthma and some children who did in fact have asthma. Uh, and the kinds of uh, things that we sometimes find are things like bronchiectasis, structural tracheal problems, um, and uh, allergic alveolitis, but these things are, are, are rare. Uh, when we've looked at what we found on bronchoscopy in children referred with asthma, we found that some of them had cystic fibrosis, uh, some of them on that middle uh, bronchoscopy picture there, you'll see a little hole before the end of the trachea, that's a tracheoesophageal fistula, and uh, on the right you see significant uh, malacia, which gets better when you give uh, positive pressure. The point is of this slide is that yes, not all the coughs and wheezes is asthma, but alternative diagnoses are things that we should think about when the history or the presentation doesn't fit. We quite often shoehorn people 
into a diagnosis of asthma and miss something else. But the clues are always there. In none of these kids were we surprised to find something, uh, uh, you know, something additional or, or, or instead of asthma. And uh, next slide, please. And these are just some other cases. These, uh, all four of these, were referred from primary care with a story of asthma. The first is a child. Uh, that's a um, a, a larynx there, and that you can see it folded in on itself. That's a child with laryngomalacia, a 10 year old child, and that's her spirometry, which looked like a really abnormal pattern. The three pictures on the top right are someone who was coughing up casts of, um, of the airway like that, and, and also had limb pains and was, you know, funny presentation turned out to have Churg Strauss. At the bottom left is a teenage boy with a carcinoid tumour and at the bottom right is a young child with laryngeal papillomatosis and again the point is that the clues were all there in the history they didn't quite fit with a diagnosis of asthma so that's the first cautionary tale that not everything that is a respiratory symptom is a symptom of asthma um, but the clue is always there in the history uh, next slide please uh, and the other thing is that not everything has a medical reason. Uh, you, you know that both Will and, and Louise have talked about environmental drivers of, of problems and in Liverpool where I work my estimation is that something like 75% of GP referrals that I see are just you know whether they have asthma or not. What we're really seeing is just the manifestations of poverty and we know that poor housing, air pollution, uh, exposure to smoke or smoking oneself or vaping, as, as Louise has uh, quite rightly highlighted, um, poor nutrition and stress are all things that can manifest as cough and shortness of breath. And, and it's really important that we think about non-medical drivers, both antenatally and postnatally. Um, the, a really key time, as we'll come on to, for lung development is in utero, so antenatal factors are important as well. Next slide, please. The third cautionary tale is that unlike other conditions, we haven't got amazing tests for uh, asthma and we certainly don't have tests for preschool wheeze. The tests that we do have have their place. And as Louise has uh, very eloquently described in papers in the past, you know, you wouldn't make a diagnosis of hypertension in an adult without testing the blood pressure. Why are we not pushing for objective tests in asthma? And she's exactly right to say that. The slight difficulty that we have is that in isolation, these tests, if you're sitting on the fence and are not sure whether the child has got asthma or not, in isolation, these tests aren't currently robust enough to really move you off the fence one way or the other. Um, but hopefully more, more work will be done in this area. And the next slide, please. And so that's why it all comes back to basics. It all comes back to your history and to a lesser degree, uh, but an important degree examination. But for me, it's like this, where's Wally picture? It's all about the detail, the devil's in the detail. So when we think about cough, we're thinking about a dry cough, not a wet cough. Asthma doesn't cause wet cough. You can have asthma and have a wet cough, but it'll be something else. We think about wheeze and we have to demonstrate to parents what a wheeze means because people have, so that's my dog barking at the door. We think of breathlessness, but in asthma, the breathlessness tends to be a chest tightness with a very typical pattern, usually with exercise. We think about variability of symptoms and we think about whether the child has got uh, A to P. And the next uh, slide please. So when we think about all those things, those cautionary tales, what do we do with the preschoolers? We know that 50% of preschoolers wheeze uh, and they tend to fall into three different groups and we're lucky in asthma in that we have um, we, we've had large birth cohort studies that we can learn from. We don't know everything about it by any stretch, um, but we do know some things. So there's one group of preschool wheezers who present early, often in the first year of life, and they can be transient. They can stop wheezing uh, after a year or so. They tend to be non-atopic. They tend to be born with small airways and carry on with small airways through the life course, but they don't have high levels of reversibility or hyper responsiveness and one driver for this is antenatal health nutrition stress and antenatal smoking and uh, next slide please 
So you've got your transient early wheezers and the next group to think about is the non-atopic wheezers. So they might start to present in the first couple of years of life with wheezing with rhinovirus infections, for example. Uh, and it tends to be quite mild. They tend to have reasonably normal lung function, but they tend to have high levels of hyper responsiveness of their airways. And the next group, please. There's the next slide. So the next group is this, the group that uh, presents early, early onset atopic asthma who tend to have reasonably normal lung function until they're about six, but not always. Um, but they tend to have uh, more severe symptoms, more severe exacerbations. And if you look at that chart there, and if you, if you follow up at the age of about three, when most of your preschoolers might, uh, might, might be coming uh, to, to, to the practice, you'll see that these kids could fall into any of those categories, which makes it very difficult. And you can see, or you, you, you can imagine that whatever we say to someone at, at about whether their preschool child has got asthma or not might change within six months or, or, or a year. Children flip in and out of these phenotypes. It makes it very difficult. So the next slide I think should be, ah, good, this approach. Right, so we sat down as a, uh, across our network about three or four years ago, probably three years, it was definitely pre-pandemic because we sat down together and uh, we looked through, we did a really detailed review of all the evidence that we had available. And there was some new evidence at the time. And we, we thought, and that was with secondary care, primary care, and I think some patients and some nurses. It was, it was really good. Um, and this is what we decided. We thought in some ways it's difficult to either make a diagnosis or not of asthma or preschool wheeze in, in the preschool children. And if anything, it's a bit of a spectrum. And there's a group of kids who are more like preschool asthma, and there's a group of kids who are less like asthma and more like preschool episodic wheeze. And from the evidence, these seem to be the three key questions that determine two things, that determine whether they respond to daily or, or regular inhaled steroids and whether they will grow out of their problems. We know that 50% of kids uh, in, in their preschool years wheeze at some point, 50% of them grow out of it and 50% of them grow into children who have some degree of asthma uh, at some point. So these are the three questions. What are they like when they're well? What are their interval symptoms? Do they particularly wheeze when they're well or not? Are there exacerbations and attacks? Are, are, are they severe? Are they frequent? Or are they just very mild and just need a little bit more salbutamol? And crucially, are there any of the following markers that might indicate some type of type 2 inflammation? A to P, either in the child or particularly the mother or, or siblings, eosinophilic inflammation, um, which, you know, in the preschoolers, it's difficult to test for nitric oxide. Um, but serum eosinophilia, a full blood count can be the most useful of, of these investigations here, or certainly uh, an useful investigation. And is there any marker of sensitization either on IgE or RAST or, or, or skin prick testing? And in essence, the more of those that point to yes, the more likely it is that they have a preschool version of atopic asthma. And the more of those answers are no, the more likely they just have preschool episodic viral induced wheeze. And this becomes important because the more like asthma they are, the more you should be thinking of treating them with inhaled steroids. And the more like preschool wheeze they are, the less likely they are to benefit from preschool, uh, sorry, from, uh, from, from inhaled steroids. So that's our regional approach for this. Um, and I think uh, it, it seems to have worked really well in, in, in our network, both in, in primary and secondary care. And I think those three questions are key. Next slide, please, which I think might be my summary. And yeah, it is. So here's my summary of things. Lots and lots of preschool children wheeze. 50% of them grow out of it, 50% of them don't. The point is that most of those children um, will have some kind of wheeze spectrum diagnosis, but many of them won't. And we should think about both the symptomology and the presentation. This might not be viral wheeze. It might not be asthma at all. It might be something else. And it's important that we get back to the history and get the basics right. And there are three questions that I think uh, work well in clinical practice. What are they like on a good day? 
Are there severe and or frequent exacerbations? And is there any suggestion of an underlying type two inflammation? The more of those that are yes, the more confident we are to give them steroids and say it's asthma. Um, and the more that are no, uh, we would uh, move more towards preschool episodic wheeze. And I've just seen Will's camera come on. He's in a car. I'm hoping you're somewhere nice. Um, and so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Ian, uh, and to all the presenters. That's great. Look at that. Bang on quarter past one. So we've got 15 minutes for questions. I'm just going to um, pull some of the ones that have come out of the chat. So um, one of the first ones was a question about um, uh, Mart and Mart regimes um, uh, versus um, versus the kind of previous and um, the current guidance around um, in health corticoid steroids out uh, with them um, with with as required uh, as required salbutamol. So there is a bit more of a move towards Mart mentioned in Gina guidelines. Um, it's not um, widely utilised in primary care at the moment. Um, what's um, what's the view on the future of uh, future of that? Should we should we be moving more towards that? Um, so I mean I think this is a question that all three of you might have a a, a view on. Um, whoever gets in first can answer first. I'm going to get in before Louise says Mark's the way forward because I know what Louise is going to say. I know. I I I personally think that if you can get a patient to take regular inhaled corticosteroids properly and well, the vast majority do well, and then don't necessarily need a more expensive inhaler type. Um, but the challenge is getting them to do that well, and the biofeedback you get from having a maintenance and reliever therapy is very helpful for certain groups. And given the availability of medicines that we've got for different ages in the teenagers, it's a brilliant strategy. Because they won't sustain any technique you teach them probably very well. Um, I'll let the conversation towards the parents. I think that, that that's the key to success. Uh, Louise? Thanks. So actually, I would agree with you, Will. I think it's it's really about patient preference and patient choice and what patients are likely to take, what their aims are. And, and I think even, you know, the the kind of the as needed ICS for motorol studies, those who take regular inhaled steroids do better in terms of symptom control. Asthma attacks don't seem to differ between the groups. This is I'm talking about the mild patients here. But if patients want to have absolute control and they're likely to take an inhaler every day, then, you know, ICS and and salbutamol is the right one for them, particularly teenagers who have quite infrequent symptoms. What you don't want is them just being on a salbutamol inhaler. And I think that's the worst of all worlds. So if they're not likely to take inhaled steroids and all they've got is a, a, a salbutamol reliever, that's all they'll take. And I think that's where the risks are. Um, yes, but I probably said enough because actually I have um, I did a podcast on it as well. So I think that got released today. So there's more on the podcast just to promote that as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. It's a good point, Louise. So, um, uh, Chris, if you could put um, a link or Jojo could put a link into the chat about where all of the kind of podcasts, etc., that have been created for this year's campaign are, are available, so so people can can find all of the things that we we reference. Um, Ian, any, uh, yeah, any yeah, two thoughts? Two two things to 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 say. So, firstly, we moved to Mart as being our default in children or in adolescents who had uncontrolled asthma on fixed, oids, uh, fixed dose uh, inhaled steroids about four years ago and we haven't looked back and uh, we've been quite honest with the adolescents and we've said in essence this is a way of forcing you to have inhaled steroids when you're asking them back and uh, and, and they, they accept that um the other thing to just plug and and i'd be very happy for people i'll put my email address in 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 here we're running a, I mean, that, so that's adolescence. What we uh, are doing at the moment is a large 2000 patient randomized control trial of daily versus intermittent inhaled steroids, as in only on days when you need your uh, salbutamol in, in children um, in primary care with mild asthma. Uh, we're running it through CPRD, so it's all routinely collected data. Uh, we've got 100 practices open already and we're looking for 150 more. It's a really light touch study. It's an NIH start study, so you get paid for it. Uh, and I'll put my um, email in the chat. 
and if you might be interested in in taking part in that it's a really lovely study it's a it's a nice study to be involved with uh, just drop me a line thanks ian um and that just my quick, point. just just quick follow-up question on that um so with with mart would you uh would you also for some of these children who are on a mart regime also be um um, prescribing a salbutamol inhaler as well, or is it their mar and that's it? Oh, Everyone's great. It's, it's, a, it's a great question. And my, I'm very adamant that we shouldn't because I think they revert to using it and it takes away the whole beauty of mar, which is that you're forcing people to have steroids. And we run into some difficulty, which is, is that some people, when they're having an asthma attack, find it difficult to take a dry powder inhaler but I still don't think the answer is for them to carry Ventolin around I, I think you know Ventolin as uh, Ventolin so, you know MDI salbutamol is what I mean um you know that's something that we can sort of have in other places in schools for example one of the things that I think could be really beneficial and we do use this off license in our adolescents who struggle to take a dry powder inhaler is that we do prescribe a fair amount of Foster in teenagers particularly from like sort of 14 upwards mm -hmm. in the teenagers mm -hmm. who struggle to take a dry powder inhaler either just at rest or or, or when they're breathless um, but yeah i think personally the more we can phase out salbutamol the, the, the better i think we'll look back on it in decades to come and go remember when we used to use that drug that just masked all the mm -hmm. symptoms and didn't get their asthma better yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And having that salbutamol kind of backup just completely defeats the object of MART. And yeah, I, I re am really quite kind of yeah, exactly the same. Wouldn't prescribe salbutamol, would kind of take it away completely. Um, yeah, and I think it's a shame that we don't have a, an MDI version of kind of ICS for Mosterol for younger children. And we do sometimes use the 100 over 3 MDI off licence um, to get around that as well. Okay, so that that answered one of the questions, which is what what's licensed in under um, twelve. Can, can, can I just put a note of caution in there? Actually, um, and I'm laughing because Ian sent me a, a, a great WhatsApp a second ago. But uh, the um, the uh, I think for an emergency, I don't think we yet know that it's okay not to have subutamol PMDI and spacer in the house, um, because I, I I've certainly seen. In children over the course of my career who've not been able to take their uh, dry powder device and I won't name the dry powder devices but there are several different ones that have caused problems and during that acute severe episode they didn't have enough inhalation to suck and effectively get their treatment and I think it's a safety thing but I do I would say that 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 should be in a box marked only for emergencies and if it's opened you need to go to hospital uh you know there's there's other things that but i don't think we can get away with saying just just stop having salbutamol i think we might run into some problems if we did so i think um as a so, sort of speaking as somebody from primary care and thinking about the bigger picture here as well um for those who are uh, from primary care wondering whether or not um this is now the new guidance for all of us and this is what we should be doing instead the answer to that is it's probably a good thing, but if you're not experienced in prescribing much, you probably shouldn't start doing that. But there's no reason to not be engaged in your like local um, asthma network um, to make sure that you have got the appropriate skills and, and understand the kind of pros and cons of doing it. And then if you have the, that skill set, great. But this isn't a, a kind of advert to go back to your practice, do a search on all of your asthma patients and convert all of them from Cleno onto um, uh, uh, onto a mark regime instead. So just still a um, yes, fine to do it if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, don't start putting people on marks. I think that's probably the, the sensible thing. Yeah. Can I, can I also make a plea and put some context here? Because I think for Louise, myself and Ian, we are all dealing with a population that are, are poorly controlled by definition because that's why they've been sent to our service. So if you've got a patient who's well controlled, on a non mart regime, the worst thing you can do is switch them. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing I would highlight is that MART, so maintenance and reliever treatment, they're, they're the kind of the higher steps. And some of what I was talking about is where you just use ICS for Motorol as needed. And that's not in the NICE guidelines. That's not currently part of the UK recommendations. So, but, but MART, maintenance and reliever, those kind of step three, four patients is. But yeah, Will's completely right. Don't, if something's not, not, broken no something's oh anyway 
<laughs> Keep going. Yeah, with it 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 it. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, yeah. So so it's more for, for us in primary care is to be aware mm. of the fact that this is a way way of treating asthma, um, and that's really you know it's it's the awareness of it rather than kind of now this is the new guidelines. We may see it on guidelines in the future, but it's not currently on um on you know nice and bts i know um gina you know gina is the the kind of recommendation so it's not business as usual yet but just to be aware that there's a very strong likelihood we're going to be seeing a lot more of it and we'll be doing more of it in primary care in the future um so uh let me have a look and um, there's some questions around kind of keeping an eye on time as well so there's some questions around um uh no, I'm going to kind of broaden this out as well a little bit. I think this was picked up. So there were some questions around pheno and its value for monitoring diagnosis. I'm going to broaden that out to also include um, spirometry because I know in primary care land, speaking as a GP myself, um, access to spirometry and pheno, not actually that easy for us. And yet, you know, NICE guidelines seems to suggest, um, along with COAF, that we have to be we have to be doing that and if we're not doing it we can't make a diagnosis so um yeah if you could um speak to that to reassure uh colleagues around um the value um let's go i mean ian you did touch on this a little bit in your um presentation do you want to do you want to speak to it first and just go to the others after yes spirometry and pheno again you know in and of themselves in isolation without a good history that that's not how you make a diagnosis of asthma. It's got to be uh, the the kind of test that we do to to, to confirm uh, what we what, what you know our pre-test probability in, in in a sense. But the practicalities of doing it are, are are difficult. And you know we know that in primary care people have been using peak flow for a long time, which we tend not to in our centre. I'm not sure what Will and Louise do, but we've tended not to use peak flow actually when you look at the evidence compared to spirometry and pheno it's it's it's, it's not that bad in terms of um, monitoring i know will made a comment about the ricino study before and there's an that there's a um, follow-up which is uh, starting called the spiromax study looking at whether measuring these tests and making decisions based on 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 the results um is, is beneficial um but the answer is currently no, not really. We shouldn't be basing all our decisions on 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 the physiological tests. One thing that is happening is the move towards diagnostic hubs in primary care, which I think is causing people a lot of stress at the moment. In essence, the history behind that is that we found out that they were making diagnostic hubs for adults, and they were about to push through and sign off on the business case, and we all went. You can't do that without doing it for children as well. So we've tagged children onto the adults in there and there will be nuances and things to think about. But the drive, the idea really is that it should make it easier for people in primary care to access these these tests. Um, and I think it will take some smoothing out, but it's very much the direction of travel, certainly in England at the moment. Yeah, thanks. Was that, I forgot uh, your question. Was that what you asked me? Yeah, it was about it was about pheno the importance of pheno and spirometry in making a diagnosis because we seem to be told that we have to and um, and um we don't have access to it it's um quick comment from louise and then a quick comment yeah. from will and then we will have to wrap it up so just on the diagnosis so ian and i disagree a little bit on this actually i think peak flow does have value in so if you don't have access to spirometry pheno and the other thing to say is that asthma is variable and therefore you can have normal spirometry on one occasion it can be abnormal on another so actually doing a period of peak flow monitoring and i wouldn't you know i'd just do two weeks and if that then relates to symptoms you know if people have got symptoms and they've got peak flow variability then i think then that shows that you have got airflow obstruction um, I worry about, you know, children who you've never demonstrated airflow obstruction or airway inflammation as to what it is that's driving their symptoms. But it's about, I think one-off testing has got limited, probably limited value actually, unless it's abnormal. Yeah, uh, Will? Yeah, I, I do think some of this might be driven by cough in my local area. Yeah. I say peak flow, variability, and keeping a dive to well, can you try turning your camera off? Sorry. Good. As Pheno you know, and as good as spirometry when done individually. But of course, 
summatively, if you've got all, all of them, if you've got them all, they all had a little... Yeah, yeah so, yeah. I thought I was out of juice. I keep on trying on and off. Um, yes, I agree with Louise. Deep Slow Diaries are very good. Probably better in isolation well I'm really um, really sorry your your connection's just gone really uh, bad so I can't, can't hear anything one off spirometry one off measurement but if you've got all three use all three okay I think we, we got some we got some of that well thanks so much um, and yeah for colleagues in primary care it does seem yeah, um, uh, so it does seem for colleagues in primary care, as, as um, I'm, I'm a GP myself, it does seem like it's the only way you can make a diagnosis. But actually, um, uh, using using peak um, peak flow diary will give you um, evidence of variability and response to treatment. Um, and you can actually code for quaff using that. But you have to, um, if you are in an area where you don't have access to pheno or spirometry, there are exclusion codes. So if you say not available or not indicated and click on those codes within within I certainly I know EMS I'm afraid I can't speak to other systems um, and then utilize codes for um, variability and um, response to treatment and um, that does actually tick your cough boxes for you without doing spirometry or pheno obviously if you have access to these investigations great and I think the information we've all had here is that all of these tests have to be taken in consideration of the history and that is actually probably the most um, the most important thing this other information is um, the the physiological tests are helpful to add to that so um, apologies all this is one of those things that we could have spent ages and ages talking about we only had an hour um, I'd like to say a huge thank you to our speakers I uh, can't believe how much you managed to get through in the tiny amount of time that we allotted to you so thanks to Ian Louise and to Will of course um, the uh, link was put into all of the Ask About Asthma campaign resources, so do please um, click on that. Find all of the other podcasts and webinars. Um, obviously, the presentation from the, um, the conference that was uh, yesterday is all on there as well. Um, and uh, yeah, a big thank you to the behind the scenes team. Um, uh, so um, currently on here, we've got Joe, um, Jojo and, and Chris, and then um, obviously Georgie, who's not here as well and everyone else from NHSE who've actually made this webinar, but also this entire week possible. Huge thank you to you guys for the uh, magnificent work you've done again uh, this year. Uh, great, that's it. Thank you all so much for joining us. Apologies we overran slightly. Um, it's, been, it's been emotional. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.